to come down hitting the ovaries, and the ovary does something going, I don't know what to do. You go first. Well, you go first. There could be a big bad sperm out there. You know. <laughs> so they go, nothing happened. So out of frustration, you get a bombardment of these hormones hitting the ovary, and the spillover effect causes some adrenaline to be released. Next slide. So what you get is this, you know, with this decline in estrogen and progesterone and testosterone, because there's no response, there's no the estrogen stays low, the progesterone stays low, the testosterone's down as well. You get an over-secretion of these hormones, and with adrenaline you get hot flashes, light sweats, insomnia, and it goes on for a number of years. Can't be fun. So the thinking was, and this is not irrational, what if we put some estrogen and progesterone back into the body, this gland up here will think, everything's hunky-dory, and it won't bombard the ovaries anymore, and she'll feel better, and the estrogen will help to keep calcium in bone, and uh, her skin will be good, and she'll have a great sense of well-being. And so they created hormone replacement therapy. That was the thinking, and it, it had some merit. Next slide. Oh, sorry, go back. Oh, no, that, that is the next one. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, the thing that also happens when estrogen drops down is that uh, calcium leaks out of bone makes you more prone to osteoporosis. So now it's a wake-up call here. And, uh, and you can't clear cholesterol from your bloodstream as well. So women, you know, when they're younger, they're eating cheese and french fries, and their cholesterol, got normal cholesterol, normal, normal, after age 50, their cholesterol's going through the roof. Same diet, because they can't clear it as well. After age 50, um, heart disease is the leading cause of death in women in this country. So it becomes an implicit and important feature. We'll talk about this. And of course, there's atrophy, and they, they, you, know, you dry up a little bit more. Next, uh... And so the medical solution was hormone replacement therapy. The problem is that the type of hormone replacement therapy they used originally were very, very potent estrogens. And so even though they were good for keeping calcium in bone and shutting off hot flashes and so on, and making them feel better, making their skin look better as well, uh, the side effect was that it was like putting fertilizer on breast cells. So they started to divide too quickly. Remember what I said about the prostate? Like if cells divide too fast, they make genetic mistakes that can lead to cancer. So when you put potent estrogens into the body, those breast cells divide too quickly. And they can make more genetic mistakes. And so the Women's Health Initiative study, the Nurses' Health study, showed us that women using hormone replacement therapy had an increased risk of breast cancer. Their, their blood got a little bit too sticky. And so there was an increased risk of heart disease and stroke. And so now they're trying to agree more with these bioidentical hormones. There's new ways of trying to do this. What I want to show you is that, and so the thing that was really curious is that when they stopped recommending hormone replacement therapy the same way, in the very first year after, breast cancer has actually dropped by 7%. Um, is that a coincidence? I don't know. But it's, it's kind of, you know, it's, it makes you think. So if we go to the next slide. Thanks, man. Women are still going to spend one third of their lives in the postmenopausal years. And they're saying, you know, I want to feel good, I want to look good, I don't want my bones to collapse, I don't want to go through all these exaggerated symptoms. Before there was hormone replacement therapy, doctors in this country actually used black cohosh as a primary method. In Germany, they still use it. It's a plant that has these sort of estrogen lookalike compounds, but they're fairly weak estrogens. And then in recent years, we've seen that we've been able to control hot flashes with soy isoflavones. And with an active ingredient in rice bran oil called gamma arosinol. So we go to the next slide. So what I did is I put together a, a concoction of black cohosh soy extract and gamma arosinol back in the late 90s. You know, we, this is one of the best selling products that Adiva has. Because it, it tells the body there are some, there is some estrogen around. It's a weak estrogen, but it's enough to help block the overstimulation of the ovaries so women feel better. Some of the soy isoflavones help to keep calcium and bone. And uh, women, about 80% of women do really, really well with that cocktail. It's about 20%, it's just not potent enough for them. They have to look for other things. But for 80% of women, they do well. Now, a lot of women sort of know about this. Can I go to the next slide? That there are these natural agents, but sometimes they choose things that are dangerous. So I'm going to show you these three things are dangerous to you. Even though they're natural, natural things can be very dangerous. So Dom Quay or Angelica species and licorice fruit and red clover isoflavones, although they have sort of estrogen lookalike compounds that can also tone down uh, menopausal symptoms, they also contain active ingredients called coumarins. You know how the word coumarin sounds like the drug coumadin? It's for a reason. It's a very powerful anticoagulant. Now when you have a, a powerful anticoagulant like coumadin in your body, you know, sometimes your platelets can't clot in time. It can lead to a bleeding disorder. Same with coumarins. Women are showing up who are using natural agents like this, and they're ending up with bleeding into the brain, behind the eye, the subarachnoid space, into the intestinal tract, into an internal organ. 
These are dangerous alternatives to use. I would suggest strongly that these are not the active ingredients that you choose to help manage this or even PMS. And, no matter, and a lot of women over the age of 50, they're already taking an aspirin a day, which is an anticoagulant. And then you add another anticoagulant substance to that, like angelica species, you're asking for trouble, big, big trouble. So I would really caution you against doing that. Also, there's um, if you need extra help with your bones, if you're not getting the, the levels of calcium required, 1,500 milligrams a day, 1,200 to 1,400 IUs of vitamin D a day, and the extra magnesium, and some other bone support nutrients, if it depends on your diet. You know, if you have a really great diet, you're getting the vitamin D and the calcium and so on, then over and above a high potency multivitamin, you may not need anything else. Uh, but if you're not getting enough calcium and magnesium and so on from food and a regular high potency supplement, you may want to think about a bone support supplement just to give yourself some extra nutrients in that regard. If this is an important consideration. Next slide. It's important for this reason. Not only can you develop you know, compression fractures in the upper spine, but when you look at osteoporosis, next slide, we see that uh, here's normal bone. And then when you start to lose calcium from bone as you get older, the bones become more porous. The structure, some of that structure is gone. The, the, the framework of the bone is disappearing. And it's important, it's important because one in four women over the age of 50 in our society, it happens to them. One in eight men, as they get older, it happens. Men are living longer now. They're starting to develop osteoporosis problems. One in eight men. And the consequences are quite severe. If you go to the next slide. We know that. If you step off a curb and fracture a hip because you have osteoporosis and the bones are weak or you have a small injury of some kind or, or a small fall, that if you fracture the neck of the femur, that now you can't walk. Now you, lie, you have to go into the hospital, lie down. Fluid collects in your lungs, and while you're lying there, immobilized, it becomes a pooling ground for bacteria. People get pneumonia, and they die. You say, how common is that exactly? More women die from a scenario like that in Canada every year than the combined death rate from breast and ovarian cancer. Isn't that unbelievable? Now, we have some idea how to prevent breast cancer and some idea how to prevent ovarian cancer, but well, that's more of a mystery. But we know exactly how to prevent osteoporosis. No, this should never, ever happen, ever. Now, back in the days of, you know, our parents, where they didn't have this knowledge about calcium and vitamin D and magnesium and weight-bearing exercise, you have to forgive that generation of people. They're in walkers and wheelchairs now because their bones are collapsing. You know what? It's large enough. They didn't have this information. But the information now is available. If this happens to you, shame on you. It's ridiculous. It's 100% preventable. But you have to get the 12 to 1,500 milligrams of calcium. At least 1,000 I use of vitamin D. A lot of people can find that calcium. But the vitamin D can be a challenge. Because we evolved this way. We evolved so that... When we go outside and there's sunlight, sunlight hits our skin and we make all the vitamin D that we need. But as some lunatic people thousands of years ago did, they started to move away from the equator. I wake up every day now and I say to myself, you know what's wrong with my life? I'm way too far from the equator. <laughs> Something happened here. I don't know what I'm doing here, how I got here, but I am way too far from the equator. Not only is it affecting me from a, a mood standpoint, but I'm not making the vitamin D that my ancestors made. And so, once from October to May in Canada, and, and anything that's sort of, if you look at the United States and you, and you sort of put a line halfway through, you sort of bisect it half that way. Anyone living in the upper half is already too far away from the sun. That even in January, if the sun was shining, you exposed your skin to the sun. The intensity of the sunlight is too weak. You can't make any vitamin D. We're too far away from the equation. So you say, well, where can I get it from food? Not a lot of places. That's the thing. If you're eating sardines and mackerels on a regular basis, you've got a chance. Now, well, I, I, listen, I follow hundreds of people's dietary records in my professional career. Not a lot of people on a daily basis have sardines and or mackerel. Uh, maybe some of you do. Anybody in the audience? Because last night in case there was a person. So there we have one tonight. So it seems to be every night, wherever I go, whatever city I'm in, one person is doing this, and you know, and the audience, it's a great thing to do. It also has a lot of calcium, by the way. And omega-3 fats. But because I'm getting my vitamin D from fortified milk products. No, you're not. In an eight-ounce glass or an eight-ounce serving of even high-fat, low-fat yogurt, it doesn't matter. There's only 100 IUs of vitamin D. You're not going to get to 1,000 IUs a day. So if you're taking a high-potency multivitamin that's 400 milligrams, 400 IUs a day, rather, and you're getting some from food, I would still suggest you get extra vitamin D from supplementation to make sure you cross that 
that border because not only is vitamin D required to reduce risk of, of uh, osteoporosis, but it plays a big role as you're going to see in cancer prevention as well. Okay, so now let's backtrack. That's sort of the, you know, genetic time bomb story and how you can counter with certain supplement combinations at certain points in your timeline. But then if we backtrack and we talk about the effects of lifestyle on heart disease and cancer, there's a few things I just want to highlight for you. Can we just take that next slide? So in vascular disease, what, what sort of sets the stage for a heart attack, a stroke, or gangrene setting into your fingertips or your toes, is that over your lifetime, fatty, waxy material starts to build up in the walls of the artery. And then it can eventually occlude the artery altogether and blood can't get by. Or some platelets, into the, if, you're, if you're eating a diet where, you're, where your platelets get really sticky and clumped together, they form a final plug. Blood can't get through. <gasps> you have a heart attack. Next slide. What happens? As your cholesterol level, a lot of that fatty, waxy material in your blood vessel wall is cholesterol. What we know is this. As your cholesterol level goes higher, your risk of coronary heart disease also goes higher, dramatically. The Framingham Heart Study tells us that if you want to really be not at risk for, for a heart attack and cardiovascular risk, that your total cholesterol level should be 3.9. Now, many medical doctors, if you don't have other risk factors for a heart attack, will say, I'll allow you to be at 5.2, but you see at 5.2, there's still a fairly significant chance you're going to have a heart attack. You understand that? Your doctor can say, you're fine, you know, you're fine. And then the person has a heart attack. Say, what the, how come they told me it was fine, my cholesterol was okay? It wasn't okay. They're setting the bar too low. The bar's too low. You want the bar that you want to set for your, to your total cholesterol level is at 3.9, not 5.2.